Hello everyone, in this video we will talk about a new integration technique called the method of substitution. Uh, first let's talk about the chain rule because it's going to be tied to the method of substitution. So remember that the chain rule just says if you have a composition of functions right, then the derivative is, take the derivative of the outside, plug in that inside function, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So then if you want to do some sort of, you know, reverse chain rule then, what would that mean? Well, we can just go backwards, right? So if you see something of the form f prime of g of x, g prime of x, dx, and you want to take the antiderivative, right, the indefinite integral here, well, this would just be f of g of x, right? So what we're going to look at are things like these. So our substitution will be for this inside function g of x. So most people call it u, but you can call it anything, right? I mean, you could call it t, you could call it smiley face. Uh, if you're having a rough day, right? You can call it frowny face, who cares? Um, the point is you're substituting something for this inside function. And then our du, right? Because an integral should have what variable you're integrating with respect to. In this case, it would be u, because we've changed our variable from x to u. Uh, then du would be, well, take the derivative of u, so g prime of x, and then dx here. And so basically, it turns this integral here into something of the form, well, integral of f prime of u, du, just directly substituting in. Every time we see g of x, we're putting a u, and du, for g prime of x dx is equal to f of u, oh, and on these I should have a plus c, right? Because this is the indefinite integral, I should have a family of functions. So now we'll just go through a few examples, uh, see how to identify problems where the method of substitution is going to be useful, and then figure out how to actually carry it out. All right, so let's say we stumble upon an indefinite integral like this one. So the first thing that I want you to notice here is that this has an inside function, but now that doesn't always mean that the method of substitution is going to work. So you're looking for an inside function, right? But when you do the chain rule, right, you don't just get some inside part back, you also have to multiply by the derivative of that inside, right? So you want to look for the inside function, but you also want to look for the derivative of the inside function to be showing up as well, right? So in this case, our inside, uh, just to get you used to seeing things other than u, let's just call this w, is our inside function, and that seems to be x squared minus 3, right? It's inside the square root. Well, what's, what's the derivative of w? Well, that's going to be 2x, and then, again, because we're going to be integrating back, we want to view this as like 2x dx. Um, oh, but we see that as well, right? So 2x dx is already showing up there as well. So if I substitute for this, what am I going to get? I'm actually going to get a much simpler integral. So I have the integral of 2x dx just is dw over here. And then I've got the square root of w. So suddenly I've turned this, you know, I changed my variables. and I've turned this into a very simple thing. And this is great, right? Because if I write this as w to the 1 half dw, this is just a reverse power rule. Right, we can just do this in one step and not have to worry about you know, chain rule or anything like that. And so you would get 2 thirds w to the 3 halves plus c. And then we started with something in terms of x. We should end with something in terms of x. So we just substitute back. So 2 thirds, my w is x squared minus 3 to the 3 halves plus c. All right, so our general strategy here is to look for a function and its derivative both inside your integral, right? Those, that function usually is an inside function, but not always. We will see an example here in a bit where it's not really an inside function. Um, but as long as it and its derivative show up, then you can rename that function some variable. Its derivative then becomes d, that variable. You can then substitute those in and then deal with an easier integral, right, using just kind of basic methods. And then once you get your answer, you substitute back and write your answer in your original variable. So let's look at this one. Now, this may not jump out at you as having an inside function, but if you see a fraction, right, 
Another way you could write this if you wanted to would be 3x squared times 6 plus x cubed to the minus 1. And if you write it this way, it's pretty clear that you have an inside function, right? It's going to be 6 plus x cubed, and so you'd want to give that a name, right? So that's my inside guy. I'm just going to call it z 6 plus x cubed, and then its derivative also shows up, right? That's my 3x squared and I've got the dx. So this is 3x squared dx. And so when I rewrite this, right, my 3x squared dx, the thing underlined in blue, just becomes dz. And I've got z, my inside function, to the minus 1. And so when I take the antiderivative here, now remember, this is not a reverse power rule 1 z to the minus 1 is just 1 over z. This, in this case, it might actually be easier to represent it this way, just to make yourself recognize the antiderivative. So this one's just going to be the natural log of the absolute value of z plus c. Uh, and then, again, we want to go back to our original variable. And so since z is 6 plus x cubed, we toss that in there. OK? So for one more example here, before you have a little exercise on this, um, this one is maybe a little bit more challenging. And so this is one that does not really have an inside function. Your, your first instinct might be to write this as ln of x times, you know, x to the minus 1 and viewing that as an inside function. But x to the minus 1 is already something we can naturally deal with, right? Like we don't really view that as an inside function. It's just a power of x. Uh, so here... I think it can be helpful instead not to rewrite it that way, but rather to write it as the natural log of x times 1 over x dx. And then hopefully you recognize that while we don't have an inside function, we do have a function and its derivative, right? Because 1 over x is the derivative of the natural log of x. So here, you know, you could write u is the natural log of x. And then du would be 1 over x dx. And so when you rewrite this, it actually just becomes the integral of u du. Do the reverse power rule. 1 half u squared plus c. And then put it back in terms of x. So 1 half times the natural log of x. Quantity squared plus c. All right. And so for your first exercise, uh, I want you to find the indefinite integral here using the method of substitution. So we've done substitution for indefinite integrals. Now I want to talk about how to do it for definite integrals. So you might think, what's really the difference, right? Because we have the, the fundamental theorem part two, which basically says indefinite integrals almost get us there, right? So if we have a definite integral, then uh, the second that we know some antiderivative big F, right? This is just going to be big F of B minus big F of A. So it seems like uh, we should be good. The, the issue is what you do with your bounds. Because once you change your variable, you change your bounds, right? So x being between 0 and 2 doesn't mean that the thing you switch it to, your inside function, is between 0 and 2. So let's look at an example. So if we have 1 from e to the pi, or from 1 to e to the pi of 1 over x cosine of the natural log of x, say. So here, we do have an inside function, right? Cosine has the natural log inside it. And we're also seeing its derivative, 1 over x, showing up. So right away, we should be thinking, all right, this is substitution. And, you know, I'm going to call, I'm going to call my inside function heart, all right? And uh, so we've got the natural log of x there. And so d heart is 1 over x dx. OK, so your first instinct may be to just directly substitute here, right? You see cosine of the natural log of x. Natural log of x is your heart. So you got cosine of heart. And then d heart, because 1 over x dx is exactly that. And then you just slap on these same bounds, 1 and e to the pi. So the problem is these are actually not the correct bounds when you do this, right? So why? Well, your original bounds, you're going from x equals 1 to x equals e to the pi. But when x is 1, heart, which is the natural log of x, is the natural log of 1. So it's 0. And similarly, right, 
part is the natural log of e to the pi when x is e to the pi and thus is pi. So when you change your variable, you're changing your bounds. And so what we really want to write is the integral from zero to pi of cosine of heart d heart. And then we can just do it as normal, right? So uh, I can use the fundamental theorem part two, uh, an antiderivative of cosine is sine going from zero to pi. So I get sine of pi minus sine of zero. And those are actually both zero, right? Zero minus zero. And so I get zero area. So one of the cool things that you should note here is that I never changed back, right? So I just kept it in this because once I do that integral, I don't need to change back to my original bounds. I already have these bounds and these are easy things to plug into sine. So this is actually one of the nice things when you're doing definite integrals about substitution is you're often just making your computations a little bit easier, right? I'm no longer plugging e to the pi into the natural log. I don't have to because I actually already did it when finding out my new bounds here. All right, so for your second exercise, I want you to compute this definite integral. So again, using the method of substitution, and I want you to think about how your bounds should change and then how to evaluate that integral.